I started off and then I shut up after that, which is great. Greetings. I hope all of you are well. Thank you for joining us for a discussion of fair use and the brand new law that might affect it, the CASE Act, which we have a stellar panel to explain today. I'm Bart Weiss. And if you have friends that couldn't make it, it's being live streamed and uh, there'll be information about that in the chat. So please check that out. It'll also be available in recorded form after that. So please share widely. I know you know somebody who needs to know about this. So please let them know. <clears throat> Along with American University School of Communication and the University Film Video Association's Documentary Filmmaker Working Group, this program is co-sponsored by some of the most important organizations in the US documentary scene. We want to thank the International Documentary Association, IDA, with support from the Logan Foundation, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, and the MacArthur Foundation. Its funding supports the professional closed captioning you have as an option here. DWORD gave us their precious Friday afternoon slot reserved for its FT F2F face-to-face -face discussions. Thank you so much. The Center for Media and Social Impact which my co-organizer, Pat, who founded that has done all of this great promotion and done all this work that has allowed us to make all these great documentaries, which are in trouble right now because of this, or maybe it will, or maybe not, we'll find out. And we have the Dallas Video Fest, which I founded and run. And of course, the American University and UFEA's documentary film working group, which I co-manage. We are also grateful, as always, for DocuLink, uh, where so many filmmakers got the news. So Pat, first of all, thank you so much for all you have done and take it away. Thank you, Bart, and for all you do and have done. And thank you to everybody who made this event possible, not least our stellar panelists and moderator. We also want to give a shout out to Matt Siklecki from American University, who is our uh, event guru today. So we have a formidable amount of legal talent here. I'm really delighted to welcome Michael Donaldson, the filmmaker's guru on fair use and the man who can apparently write those E and O letters in his sleep. Michael was part of the making of the doc filmmaker's statement of best practices, which Matt is going to give you a link to in chat. So next after Michael, we're going to hear from Meredith Rose, who is policy counsel for the leading public interest think tank, public knowledge. She focuses particularly on intellectual property and telecommunications policies, and she has been dogging the CASE Act in Washington, D.C. since it was a glimmer in the eye of the big media companies. Also, she is a pretty avid gamer. And finally, we'll be hearing from Dale Cohen. He's a law professor who could not be more engaged with the field. Along with teaching law, he directs the, U uh, the University of California at Los Angeles's Documentary Film Legal Clinic. And uh, Dale, feel free to put that link in the chat. And I imagine there are also little shrines to his pro bono work wherever filmmakers are found. Plus, he is also special counsel to one of the nation's most important public affairs documentary series, Frontline on Public Television. Finally, I am personally delighted that one of our star graduate students, Aisha Azimi, agreed to moderate this discussion. Thank you, Aisha, and take it away. Thank you, Professor, and a hearty welcome to everyone joining us today. We'd like to begin by hearing brief remarks from each of the panelists. I'd like to kick off the conversation by turning first to Michael Donaldson, as someone who has worked so extensively with filmmakers and fair use, to review briefly why fair use is so important to filmmakers and other creators. Michael? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for including me in this panel. It's the first time I've worn a tie in 11 months, for sure. <laughs> it's a pandemic dress. I had a t-shirt on for most of the morning. I decided, oh, I'll do something different. Um, fair use, since Pat and her team uh, started the conversation, I mean, fair use has been here for a long time, but it was ignored, feared, not used, and uh, generally uh, discounted. But 
the conversation started uh, some years ago when Pat and Professor Yazi <clears throat> put together a team, and I was very thankful to be on it, to uh, create a filmmaker's take on fair use, which started the whole conversation. What's surprising to, I think, everyone working on it, because the booklet was best practices for documentary filmmakers, what happened, and I, I predicted this in the first um, hearing we had before the Copyright Office, is that people who work on independent films will work on a documentary one month, and the next month they're working on a feature film. And what happened is people went over to scripted films and said, we can do this. And, and so what I wanna focus on is the tremendous impact and the expansion. I will tell you, 20 years ago, nobody making a scripted film would have thought, well, I could use fair use and make my film more interesting, more authentic, more purposeful, more informative. Uh, and so we uh, are now in our office, I mean, we, last year we worked on about 350 films, but an increasing percentage of them are scripted films. Um, films like Bombshell, uh, Fox News would never, ever have granted permission to use clips from the news programs. But we worked that out and uh, actually never got a call from Fox. Uh, we also, interestingly, worked it out so that they didn't have to go to any of the women in the film that were depicted in the film for personal rights. But that's a that's a different seminar. I'm just FYI. Um, also, uh, Oliver Stone's Snowden. Again, a lot of fair use from people who really would not have allowed the, that to be used. Um, and again, no personal rights for the characters that were portrayed in that film. It's an Oliver Stone film. So uh, these are big films, but you might say, oh, well, they were fact-based and that's how you were able to pull that off. But even totally fictional films, think a film we worked on called Uncut Gems, um, a major uh, box office run about uh, illegal gambling on uh, basketball games. The, the teams never would have given us the clips, but the filmmaker really wanted to use actual game clips. All those clips were used pursuant to fair use, and frankly, there was a lot of them. It was it it uh, it wasn't like a slam dunk. We really had to work on it because so much basketball footage was used, and of course. Along with that, uh, a lot of basketball players, no rights obtained or requested. And, and, uh, and yes, we got a call from the NBA and uh, it took a couple lawyers working maybe an hour and a half. Uh, we had a very long conference with them, but they, at the end of the conference, say, we're not gonna sue. We don't agree with you, but we're not gonna sue. Um, and this is the uh, track record, but, uh, that was a, a big film. It doesn't have to be a big film. Um, we worked on Escape from Tomorrow, which many of you saw, a black and white horror film shot surreptitiously at Disney World. Loads of fair use trademark, loads of fair use copyright material, and, and a manipulation of that material. Um, there's a scene where the boat goes through uh, I think they call it the love tunnel and there's a lot of Disney characters up there. Well, in this horror film, the Disney characters go and, and growling at the, uh, at the passengers in the boat. Um, again, no way would Disney have granted licenses for those. They were all used pursuant to fair use. Um, and again, many, many people in the background of course, couldn't ask him for <laughs> couldn't ask him for permission because that would have blown the cover. But um, we got no pushback from them. And uh, interestingly, but not surprisingly to me, 
no pushback from Disney, which segues nicely about, oh, will this case act change what I do? Uh, I hope nobody on this call leaves this uh, presentation with the idea that they have to change one bit their use of fair use. That's a constitutionally based right that you have. It's the reason we have copyright law. You know, America was founded on a very entrepreneurial, free market kind of attitude. And copyright gives kind of a limited, uh, very limited uh, monopoly rights to somebody who creates a book or a movie or anything else. So they had to put in the constitution why, they, why the Congress had a right to pass this kind of a law. And they said, it's in order to inspire new creation. That's why we have a copyright law. And don't you let any threat of litigation, because you're gonna get insurance, $10,000, $25,000 deductible, and, and frankly, we have been able, and, and we work on, we've worked on, you know, easily over a thousand films. Every time we get a claim, we've been able to talk the person off the ledge. No client of ours has been sued on a fair use case where we've had a chance to talk to the other side. It's only only two clients have been sued, and they and they never called. Uh, Yoko Ono. That's the way she is. She just filed her lawsuit. The judge not only ruled quickly against her, but made her pay our client's attorney's fees. Um, uh, another one was uh, uh, Catfish. 50% of a song was used. The judge easily ruled in our favor, but uh, no attorney's fees. They said, it was very funny. She said, 50%. I don't blame, I don't blame them for thinking maybe uh, they could uh, uh, win this one, but they didn't. Uh, and she didn't have any chance. So whatever you do, uh, don't be intimidated by the fact there's a, a new fangled forum for uh, dispute resolution. I'm really anxious to hear from um, Meredith because she's really knowledgeable on what needs to be tweaked? Uh, and I, uh, I, I'm anxious to start working on tweaking this thing because uh, it's, it's like any bill. Uh, it got rushed through. It was never really uh, talked about much with Congress as a whole um, for a variety of reasons, partly because frankly, not that, member, not that many members of Congress understand copyright. Most of them have no reason to care about copyright. If you're not from California, New York, or Nashville, you don't have many copyright owners in your district. So uh, it's, it's not an issue that is uh, beating in the hearts of most members of Congress. So it, it will need tweaking. Uh, and uh, so Aunt Meredith, I actually brought a yellow pad to take notes on what you have to say about it. And of course, Dale knows a lot about it too. Um, so please don't be intimidated. Just because there's a new playground, don't be intimidated. Um, and don't be intimidated because it's Disney. It, yes, Disney is protective, but they have good lawyers. And they're not going to be sending threatening letters that are going to be very embarrassing when it gets posted if they don't have a case. They don't, they don't do it. The big studios don't do it. Um, so anyway, back to you, Aisha. I, I think I've used my six minutes or whatever they were. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. It's really fascinating to know the history behind fair use. And thank you for putting it in context for us. With that, I'd like to next turn to Meredith us a brief overview about the CASE Act, what it is and how it will be implemented. Can you tell us a little bit about the Act itself and next steps? Sure. Um, so the CASE Act has a bit of a history behind it. Uh, the version that just passed, uh, it was tucked into the COVID relief slash omnibus spending bill that passed at the end of last year. 
Um, this was, I believe, the third or fourth iteration of an attempt at making something like this. Um, the general, so to like sort of rewind, um, the argument for uh, the Case Act as a piece of legislation uh, comes a lot from smaller artists, especially visual artists and photographers were kind of the big use case for this, saying that it is, um, they find their work is often reproduced without permission online quite a bit. And the sheer cost of bringing a federal copyright lawsuit is often prohibitive. Um, even if they were able to recover a decent amount of damages, that's a lot of time, that's a lot of money um, that smaller creators simply don't have. Uh, and it's also expensive to get a copyright lawyer. And I think that's a, a totally valid criticism uh, of the way the system works. Uh, and so the idea behind the CASE Act was, well, what if we create a smaller, more streamlined sort of court, uh, adjudicatory body, something that can resolve these disputes at low cost, relatively fast, um, without having to have a lawyer involved, uh, you know, possibly remotely, um, you know, using video conference. And this was, you know, years before the pandemic and before we do everything on Zoom. So that was pretty, pretty revolutionary. Um, but as with all things, the devil is often in the details about how you do this. Um, and so some of those details are functional. Some of the, like, how is this actually going to work? Is this actually going to do what it says on the tin, the way we've designed it? Um, some of those details are legal and are more of interest to constitutional scholars um, like uh, Professor Pam Samuelson, uh, who co-authored a brilliant paper on some of the constitutional concerns about how the Case Act tribunal is structured. Um, some of them are more concerning to copyright wonks like myself. Uh, so the basic uh, the basic sort of bucket or the, the basic way that the, the case act is supposed to work in theory, and I'm going to emphasize in theory, um, is that it offers a forum where a person who is a copyright holder can, if they find my work is being shared online, and I don't uh, think I have the resources to go through an entire copyright, uh, you know, lawsuit, that I will be able to issue, basically bring an action in the small claims court. Um, and then this judge will sit and they will be able to consider evidence from both sides and be able to determine whether I'm entitled to some uh, compensation for it. Uh, and then we can all sort of go about our business. Uh, the reality is a lot trickier. There's a whole bunch of problems with the way that the Case Act was designed. Uh, one thing, and I will caveat this up front, a lot of the details were uh, kicked down the road, basically. They sort of kicked the can on a lot of the, the actual hard details of this uh, and basically said to the Copyright Office, you go figure this out. Do rulemakings, figure out how you think this ought to work. So that's going to be another year plus before we've even settled on some of these details um, that are left within the Copyright Office's rulemaking discretion. Uh, the big one is that you have a real problem. Um, so lawyers talk about jurisdiction. Uh, jurisdiction means what power does a court or a tribunal have over the parties that appear before it. So most courts in the United States, most federal courts, uh, when you think about federal court, you generally think about, you know, court of appeals, Supreme Court, district courts. Those are what we call Article Three courts. They're provided for in the Constitution. They have a specific mandate and you are subject to their jurisdiction by virtue of being within the United States and living within the circuit. And there's, you can, there's lawyers have to take an entire class their first year on how we determine jurisdiction. But generally, when you think about courts, you think about something in the judicial branch of government um, at a federal level. So they all sort of report, they, they report up to the Supreme Court, basically. Um, if you remember your middle school civics lessons, there's three branches of government. There's the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. Uh, the problem with putting a, a uh, dispute forum like the CASE Act under the judicial branch is that there are a lot of very specific features uh, that the designers want this kind of court to have. Uh, and it's very difficult <laughs> to come in and tell the judiciary how to do their job. There's a separation of powers argument. So it's very difficult for Congress to go to the judiciary and say, okay, set up a new court and throw out all these requirements that we've established over the last 200 years for what it takes to bring a, a case in this court. So the case and controversy requirement, 
um, you know, all these other kind of jurisdictional things, throw that all out, make a special thing that doesn't have any of those attached. And also allow for video conferencing and different rules of discovery and different procedural hooks and different um, rules about whether or not you can have jurisdiction over minors. So it's very, very difficult. That's a huge lift. Um, and so the solution to this, uh, put solution in scare quotes, was, well, we'll put it uh, we'll put it within the Copyright Office. We'll make this a special tribunal that sits underneath the Copyright Office. And they will be able to, so we don't have to deal with any of that. We can design it from the ground up. It'll be fine. Uh, the problem is that the Copyright Office is not an executive branch agency. It doesn't, it doesn't report to the president. It doesn't report to the courts. It actually reports to Congress because it's part of the Library of Congress. Um, and the ability of the, uh, this is when you get a little bit into the sort of wonky constitutional arguments, but the ability of Congress to delegate, to basically create their own courts that just report to them is a really big problem. Um, that is, I think that's a constitutional not, would be a very generous way of putting it. So they put in this, you know, this whole system and said, we'll put in the Copyright Office, but to get around the fact that we don't have jurisdiction over everybody that we want to have jurisdiction over, we'll make it voluntary. Um, so the system that they set up basically is what they call an opt-out system. So um, if I receive a notice saying, hey, I am bringing an action before you in front of the small claims tribunal, I as the recipient have to have the ability to opt out of that. So it makes it more like a voluntary system, ostensibly. So if I get a notice, I've got 60 days in which I can say, no, thanks. I don't think I want to deal with this. Um, if I fail to respond for whatever reason, I am now considered to be subject to the jurisdiction of this tribunal. So it's almost like a binding arbitration kind of situation, um, which we hear people talk a lot about when, you know, you use websites or Ticketmaster or a cruise line, you know, just anything in the modern economy, you're, you're most of the time you're signing up for these sort of arbitration systems. So part of that contract when you buy something will say like, by the way, if you want to sue us, uh, you can't, we have to go to a binding arbitrator. And here's, you know, the venue and here's, we get to pick all the, the sort of parameters of how it works. Um, and so this sets up, Case Act sets up something like that. And if I fail to opt out for whatever reason, be it, you know, um, be it I don't get the letter. So like college students notoriously don't check their mail and they change addresses every 10 months. Um, if somebody is housing insecure and doesn't have a fixed address, um, you know, if there's a, uh, there's a sort of whole litany of potential cases where somebody might not respond to one of these things. Um, then you are all of a sudden dragged uh, under the jurisdiction of this court. The court itself uh, can assign up to $30,000 in statutory damages, which is about half the median income of a household in the United States. Um, and in some states, it's well above the half the median income. Uh, and they can do that with the respondent in absentia. So if you don't respond, you may still be on the hook for up to $30,000, um, even if you don't show up. Uh, judgments are not appealable. You can appeal them to the register of copyrights and then nowhere else. So there's nobody to review it. Um, and again, up to $30,000 per infringement. Uh, and there is, we're not entirely sure what kind of transparency is going to apply to this, what kind of records are going to be visible, um, if folks will be able to monitor this. And so we're, we're concerned that among all of these other problems, what this really does is create a troll farm for copyright trolls. Um, we've all sort of seen cases of bad faith copyright claims being used um, to either, you know, uh, try to kneecap a work's release or uh, as somebody who spends a lot of time on the internet, you often see the DMCA uh, being used in this way, where it's less of a copyright claim and more of a keep my name out of your mouth claim, um, which is not an actionable claim under copyright law, but a lot of people seem to think it is. Uh, and so because of this, we see this as a very tempting venue for bad actors, basically. You can file a claim, and this is not just, this venue is not just limited to, when we talk about copyright works, it's not just, you know, uh, claims over video or claims over music or claims over text. This could be claims over things like software, which are notoriously complicated and hard to understand. Um, and somebody could file a claim. And if you potentially could get $30,000 in damages, the, you know, from just having the other guy not respond, 
that math starts to look really good when you operate at scale. Um, and we've seen a lot of copyright troll attorneys in the wild, uh, some of whom are more fam famous on uh, copyright Twitter than others. Um, and so there's a real concern about how this is gonna play out in reality. Um, and the flip side of this is that because there's an opt out system, because you can, if you get a letter saying, I'm just not gonna participate, the folks who are going to opt out are the bigger corporations who everybody you know, has, a, has a problem with. Um, so like, this is not going to do anything against YouTube or Google or Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest or whoever your preferred you know, uh, bad guy is, Spotify, are all gonna opt out. So they're not gonna be subject to any of this. You're still gonna have to go after them in a federal court. The people who are gonna be left are gonna be the less sophisticated defendants, people who see a really big number on a threat letter and get kind of freaked out by it, um, and people without a legal department, essentially. Uh, and so that's the group of folks that are getting swept in under this. Uh, and so, you know, we've spent a, many years um, trying to talk about how we think this would actually work. You know, there are legitimately difficult design choices that you have to make if you want to make a forum that does all the things that people are asking this to do. Um, this version of Case Act does very few of the things it purports to do and manages to create a lot of secondary problems at the same time. Um, so we're watching it. Again, it's going to be a, quite a bit before it's fully implemented because there's all these rulemakings that have to go on now at the Copyright Office. Uh, and we're, you know, committed to keeping working with the Copyright Office to make sure that these rules and design choices that they make are as minimizing harm to third parties as possible. Thank you, Meredith, for breaking down the Case Act in a way that even makes sense to us non-legal folk. There's definitely a lot to think about, and hopefully the gears are turning for our audience members. Remember to submit your questions via the Q&A feature. And finally, to round out our discussion, well, I'd like to uh, Aisha, uh, be, 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 before we move on, uh, what's the system? Do, do, do we get to ask Meredith some clarifying questions, or is that till the end? How, how do you want to run this? Um, sure, yeah. You can ask uh, follow-up questions now, and then uh, we can turn um, to Dale. Oh, is that okay with you, Dale? Sure. Yeah, okay. Because um, there, uh, and these are coming from somebody who's read the law but didn't participate. Uh, so you, I, I defer to your knowledge. But I, you spent a lot of time um, on the very naughty constitutional question, but that ship has sailed as far as I can tell from talking to members of Congress. So we have this odd uh, place for uh, the dispute settlements, but you, you spent some time on default and I, I, I didn't, it, it seems to me that's no different than if you're sued in a regular court and you don't get served for whatever reason. Uh, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't understand how you felt, if you, if that is, from your perspective, a place where we need to push. No, I think, so I think that's totally right. I think, um, you know, this is, you know, as you point out, when you don't open your mail, you can still get held on the hook for judgments in a regular federal court. I think our concern is given the ease with which complaints can be filed in this forum, um, and the speed at which people can do it and the potential volume coming through, um, I think the risk is just greater uh, of it being used specifically to try to get default judgments as opposed to, you know, there's, there's a higher degree of friction to participating in regular federal courts. Um, and so that would cut down on the number of times that can happen or the scope of the problem. So it's really a scope question um, as far as we're concerned. Okay, yeah. um, and, and then you, you had a, uh, a, a, an issue with, trolls, which I, yeah, I've heard a lot, oh, it's going to create more troll kind. Of, and I, I think that's probably right. But I know two things, and, and I'd love to hear if this is something that uh, you want to work on during the next year and a half as we, uh, I know the law says a year, but then there's that wonderful automatic extension for another into the next summer. So we're looking at 18 months at least before this thing can get it implemented. And then, um, and that, uh, that is, uh, yes, there'll be more, more trolls. I, I think that's probably true. 
But I'm looking at two things. One, the ease of opting out. I mean, all you have to do is send an email as far as I know, but, but educate us on how you opt out, which is really important. And number two, um, what really interests me is the fact that, as, as I read it, but correct me if I'm wrong, there's no injunctive relief so that there's no threat that this film could get uh, closed down because of this dispute. Whereas when it gets filed in a federal court, the distributor bails. They say, oh, what if they get an injunction? And, and we've had films stopped. We've had films uh, that we had to fight to keep into a festival because the festival operator said, oh, but what if they get an injunction on the day of the, of the when we had planned to screen it? And, you know, we, it's that injunction fear and not the 30,000. And I think uh, if you're in distribution, a lot of distributors will say, well, we'll advance that uh, if, if that happens. Um, anyway, it could use... Could you speak to that? And then I'll shut up with my questions and turn it over to Dale. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, yeah, no, agreed about the, the injunction. Um, I will just note that there is a provision in the bill um, which allows for basically almost like a legal assistance type role that um, copyright office attorneys working under the auspices of case can provide to like help folks basically navigate to the federal court system to get things like identifying uh, information on the name of the user so that they can issue basically like, uh, I don't know what the, I'm blanking on the technical term, but basically to identify a, a user so that they can serve uh, the correct person on this. Um, and I believe there's also an injunction provision in there as well. But you're, you're correct in that the case tribunal cannot issue an injunction, but there is a, um, there is a, a provision within the case act that allows for copyright office attorneys to help steer folks towards getting those kinds of things that they can't get within the tribunal itself. Um, and I apologize because I forgot the first half of your question because I got was noodling over the second half. No, that's good. That, that, that's helpful. Let's... Okay, so I guess I can jump in and, and, and you guys have just talked about a, a couple of things I really want to address when we talk about the practical implications of this, but, but let, me, let me start off by just saying that, that the UCLA Doc Clinic works with documentary filmmakers, independent documentary filmmakers, and, and in particular, I wanna focus on the kinds of clients that we work with who are generally truly independent, generally smaller budgets. And I think that's where the greatest risks are. And you know, Meredith is, is talking about the risks. But before I get into all of that, I wanna reemphasize what Michael said, which is fair use is a very important tool in, in telling stories and, and conducting journalism and, and expressing viewpoints that, that may not otherwise get to the community, especially in this world of shrinking news resources. So I, I don't want anything that we say to scare anybody. And as Pat said at the beginning and in our pre-call, there's a lot of work to be done in this 18 months or however long it's going to take. And I'm delighted to know that Meredith is out there fighting this fight, that Pat will be organizing resources like BART and the UCLA clinic, and that Michael will be there to fight on behalf of fixing this law and making sure it does not get used against independent filmmakers. Uh, Okay, so with that as, as the preface, fair use analysis, and we do a lot of this for independent filmmakers at UCLA, and I do it at Frontline as well, it involves two things. One is, is the consideration of the legal factors, and you've all heard about the four-factor test and how squishy the law can be in this space. The more important part for the lawyers who are working with you is helping you understand the risk assessment. Right, so that you can make a good decision about what you are going to fair use, what you're going to license, and what risks you're actually facing. And, and the CASE Act isn't really changing the law side of this analysis very much, although there's one beneficial piece of it, as Meredith talked about, which is there is a cap on the amount of statutory damages for anybody who goes down this path. So it does take away the risk of blockbuster results in these copyright cases, 
But frankly, for those of you who are independent doc filmmakers, as many of you in the audience are, those aren't the kinds of situations you get into. What you get into are the disputes with the photographers or the graphic artists or the people who have done smaller bits of work and, and, and who want a piece of that budget that you've got or your insurance company's dollars to, to compensate them. And, and frankly, the photographers have a good claim that, that, that in many cases, their work is being usurped by folks unfairly. That's not the case usually in documentary film in my experience. Typically documentary filmmakers are following the best practices guidelines that Pat and Michael and Bart and others developed many years ago and, and really are behaving fairly. And that's the reason why you don't see any real cases, as Michael said, where documentary filmmakers have been hit for judgments or, and, and we frequently, we infrequently see actual lawsuits filed. But the claims that you do get right now typically would take the form of some informal letter or an email from somebody saying, hey, you took my stuff. And then, as Michael said, you have a rational conversation. Sometimes that leads to a very reasonable settlement. Oftentimes that, that results in somebody receiving a credit or saying, you know, you're right. I understand your fair use argument. I'm, I'm going to stand down. Thank you for including my work. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate the exposure that you're giving me. Unfortunately, what the, what the CASE Act creates is a situation where not only trolls, and trolls are definitely a problem, as Meredith has said, but, but individuals will simply use a process that gets created to file formal complaints right, right off the bat. In fact, I would expect that organizations like the photographers, the National Photographers Association, will create a website to, uh, to help photographers file form complaints, right? Those formal complaints present a very big problem. And this is a place where I, I slightly disagree with Michael for independent filmmakers, because my experience has been once a complaint is out there, for a small independent filmmaker, that can gum up the works substantially. If you have not yet purchased your insurance, which is usually not the preferred course, but some people can't afford to buy the insurance early in their process, you're gonna have trouble getting an insurance policy once a claim has already been filed in this small claims process. If you don't already have a distribution agreement, some distributors will shy away. And Michael's right, injunctive relief is the biggest danger, but, but lots of distributors will view a lawsuit that's already pending, even in small claims court, as just enough to push them away from that project and turn their attention to other things. So once claims have been filed, in my experience, it, it can really gum up the works for independent filmmakers. And those delays in getting distribution or getting insurance can be substantial problems. So what does that mean? In, in the course of giving advice to, to independent filmmakers, we're, I'm going to need, once this law is in place, to, to, to expose the filmmakers to what those risks are. And probably what it will mean is giving them advice on close cases that they need to be prepared, that they're going to probably want to have some money set aside to make some quick settlements so that it doesn't interfere with their distribution. So that if a claim does come in, that, that they can resolve it relatively quickly, if it's a close case. Because as Meredith said, the likelihood that, that this Small Claims Act is going to create a very fast process seems very low to me. The amount of time that litigation takes, as any of you have ever been involved in it, is very substantial. And while the act is designed to streamline the process, it still provides for discovery. You know, documents being exchanged and, and information being exchanged, which slows down the process. There's likely to be a logjam in the early stages. Again, I want to step back, though, and say, don't worry too much in the short term about this. It's going to be at least 12 months, probably 18, and maybe even more than that before any of this comes into play. Okay. But, and we're gonna to need to tweak the law and, and organizing to do that is gonna be very important, right? But 
the practical consideration is that that this law is designed to increase the number of complaints that come from small creators, from photographers, graphic artists, et cetera, videographers. And, and I believe it will actually have that impact. It will reduce the overall litigation costs over the long term, hopefully it should reduce the risks that insurance companies see and therefore should reduce premiums that, that, that filmmakers have to pay. But that'll take time for the market to adjust. Uh, in the meantime, even if you opt out after receiving one of these formal complaints, there's going to be something hanging over your project. And, and, and so resolving it may, in fact, become the right thing to do for some filmmakers and for some projects. And by the way, when insurance applications need to be filled out, one of the things insurers ask for is, have you had prior complaints against you and prior claims? So more claims has an impact on small filmmakers and independent filmmakers. Uh, there's just no avoiding that. I don't think it changes the advice that we're going to give though about what the law says. The law says, as Michael pointed out earlier, that that fair use is designed to help independent filmmakers and storytellers tell new stories. Uh, so I think we'll continue to win these arguments in these cases, but adding more complaints into the bloodstream of the copyright fair use universe is not a good thing in my judgment for independent filmmakers. I don't think it should change anything that you're doing right now, but it, it is a dangerous potential new path. And I agree with Meredith that the law needs to be fixed very badly. I'm sure you have a million questions. I could keep talking about this for a very long time, but I'd really like to get to your questions. I, I have one for you, just uh, and it's more observation. I'm curious to if you could burrow in on the E and O difficulties once you have a claim, because it sounds like our experience is a little different. We have never had we, 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 not one film in our office, and and as I say, last year it was about 350 we worked on. Um, never has one been turned down, even when there's been claims. Uh, what we do get, and it's equally dangerous almost, is, is a um, often they want to either uh, eliminate a claim from the person who made the claim or raise the deductible for a claim from that person. Uh, so it creates difficulties. And that's why we always urge all our clients to get the ENO at the very earliest possible date. And on scripted films, like Bombshell and, and Uncut Gems, all scripted films, we really insist and, and um, be, beat up our clients to have the script vetted first and get the ENO insurance on the script before they release any publicity about it. Uh, so uh, I was curious, it sounded like you have run into the problem of having a, an insurance company refuse issuance of a policy. And, and that's well, not a bit. Uh, uh, let, me, let me be more specific, Michael. Uh, first of all, we don't work with scripted filmmakers and, and we, we just work with documentary filmmakers this, and, and independents exclusively. Generally, we're talking about smaller budgets. Um, and while I agree with you that it's good for them to get insurance as soon as they can, I don't think most of those filmmakers can afford to do it as early as publicity might begin. For example, when the IDA gives them a grant, I don't think they're quite ready to spend four to six thousand dollars or three to eight thousand dollars, whatever it may take with the insurers right then and there to start purchasing their insurance. But you're right. We've never had a client who's been unable to get insurance. But what it does do is it slows down the process. And frankly, a policy that does something along the lines of what you just said, which either excludes a particular claim or raises the self-insured portion of it, for many filmmakers is a non-starter. 
right? If you take the self-insured piece of a potential claim from the subject of an investigative film up to seventy-five or hundred thousand dollars, that policy isn't particularly worthwhile for for the filmmaker uh, because they can't afford the self-insured portion of that policy. Um, so it, maybe it is a little different, and, and it's certainly different between the documentary filmmakers and the scripted ones, and, and from what I know. So, so I, I had a question uh, that could be um, for any of you, but I, I think first it's for Meredith. Um, I wondered, the, the CASE Act as it's written appears to have, as you say, little utility and a lot of problems. But the, the problem that it was intended to solve is one that many people, as I see from the questions in, that have been posed, feel very acutely that they're the little guys and their stuff is being stolen and they want, they want to have some protection and they can't afford. So I, w one question that I, I'm repeating, actually a question that's in the, in the Q&A um, is, is, is there a way to imagine a, a better written law that could give little guys a little more ability to uh, use the, their own copyright monopolies to protect themselves? Yeah, so I think there are definitely ways that can be improved. Um, I think a perfect solution would be to create a court within the regular meaning of courts, make it an Article Three court. But again, kind of as I talked about a little bit at the top, that is very difficult for a number of reasons. Um, but in an ideal world, if I was the Empress of the Universe, that's where it would go. Um, <laughs> we'd have automatic jurisdiction over everybody and we could roll from there. Uh, so a lot of those problems would be solved. Um, you know, I think there are certainly things that could definitely be done to improve it. I think limiting the damages cap even lower than $30,000, $30,000 is a pretty arbitrary number. Um, and it's a very high arbitrary number. Um, limiting the damages to something like the actual licensing fee that was forgone plus some percentage on top of it. So if it was a $700 licensing fee, you know, then cap, put it at the 30% on top of it, you get $950 to discourage sort of efficient infringement. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, what you really need to solve is this basic problem of, uh, if somebody's bringing an action in the case act, the person receiving that complaint knows this guy would really rather not probably go to federal court because federal court's really expensive and they are maybe a small guy, they're not gonna have the money to take me on. And so at the end of the day, if there's anything other than mandatory jurisdiction, um, if there's any way for that recipient to get out, they're gonna get out. Um, you know, anybody looks at this and goes like, you know, this is a tiny artist who I reprinted their stuff on a t-shirt and I just really wanna, don't wanna deal with this. I'm gonna take my chances and say that they're probably not gonna drag me before federal court. Um, and that's a problem you can't really solve unless you get into a situation where everybody is stuck dealing with this. Um, and that means figuring out the jurisdictional question. So I think there are ways to think about it. Um, that's when you get really deep into the like constitutional law scholar wonk side that I can't speak to too, de too deeply. Um, but I think that's kind of the core problem with it. Uh, you know, there is an argument that folks receiving this notice, especially small businesses, may think like, well, you know, this is, this is a forum where, you know, as Dale pointed out, the damages are capped compared to federal court. Federal court, you can get up to $150,000 in statutory damages case, you can only get up to 30. And so there might be people who look at this and go, you know what, I actually did kind of screw this up. I'd rather talk this out and go through case rather than potentially get dragged into federal court and have to deal with that. Um, those exist. But I think, you know, and part of this we're all going to see in practice. We're all just kind of trying to read tea leaves as to how this is actually going to be used in reality. Um, so that's part of it. Um, the other thing, and I, I saw this question pop up a lot in the chat, um, so I just want to answer it. We don't have a set process for opting out yet. That is one of those things where the details have been relegated to the Copyright Office. So we don't know what the, the, the notices that you are getting uh, sued um are going to be relatively standardized we don't know what those look like yet the process for actually opting out we don't know what that looks like yet um the benefit of opting out is you're no longer in front of the case tribunal uh the downside of opting out is you have to 
make the calculus about whether or not this other person is going to try to pursue it in a federal court. Um, so it's a balancing act. And a lot of these things, again, we're, we're stuck dealing with hypotheticals because the bill was vague and purposefully kind of, you know, punted a lot of these concerns over to the copyright office who had a Herculean task in front of them trying to get all this sorted out um, with a lot of very, uh, uh, to be kind, emotionally invested parties on all sides of opinions about the Case Act um, are going to be yelling into their inboxes now for the next, you know, 12 to 18 months about how they should do it one way and how if they don't do it that way, they've screwed up and so on and so forth. Um, Meredith, can I just follow up with you? And, and also, I'd love to know if Dale and Michael have opinions about this, because you mentioned that there will be highly invested parties leaping into the process. And um, the, the uh, large copyright interests have never been shy. And there are, there, are, there are fights in this area in which there are some really big opponents on the other side too. Um, it's not clear to me who are the, who are, who's on the other side and, and how, would, how, what, how should filmmakers be paying attention to this or, or will you just be sending up a flare when it's, when it's time to pay attention? Yeah, so um, definitely follow the work of, um, you know, Public Knowledge, Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, I Fight for the Future, I believe, is also getting involved in this. Um, and there will be, as part of this rulemaking process that the Copyright Office will be undertaking to establish a lot of these parameters, there will be an opportunity for public comment. Um, and so follow these groups because they will be sending up flares when there is a chance um, and we want to make sure that, you know, especially folks like um, independent filmmakers and folks who rely on fair use uh, and potentially, you know, might have, you know, there's going to be a different dynamic with every art form when you get in front of this tribunal. Like it's going to play out very differently. This the whole system was designed kind of very narrowly to address concerns of a lot of visual artists and, and photographers. Um, and so it's how much it addresses or protects or prejudices the interest of filmmakers or musicians or whatever is going to be highly dependent on how this is implemented. So keep an eye out on those groups. They will be setting up the flares when there's time for public comment. Um, also when there's final rules that look like they might be good or bad, um, but sort of follow these groups, keep up to date, um, you know, and hopefully we'll get a, a broad sampling of interested parties to weigh in and make this as fixed as we can get it. Thank you very much. And uh, there are so many questions. Uh, I wanted to say uh, I, I, heads up to many people who are asking highly specific questions about their films. Uh, no one on this panel can address your question. People like me who are non-lawyers can't answer a specific question because we would be practicing law without a license. The lawyers can't answer because they do not have a contract with you as a client. So we're not just being mean or not trying to be helpful. We, we literally can't do that. So you've got a lot of great questions. You have uh, at least two lawyers who are, can answer your question if you would like to uh, make an arrangement with them on those specifics. Um, but uh, I, I would also like to uh, turn uh, this, this back to Aisha to see whether there are other questions that uh, people have asked that are more general uh, that could re be relevant to the CASE Act and to documentary filmmaking. Before there we do that, could I ask um, Meredith a question? Go right ahead. Yeah, yeah, it follows up on Pat's question. Uh, I wonder if you could give us a list, one, two, three, of the top three or four changes that you think would help uh, fix the act. You gave uh, one, and it's a it's a great one. Change, <clears throat> change the damages. Turn it into a multiple, whether it's five or even even ten times license or less than thirty thousand. Um, that's a great idea. But you, I'm sure you have two or three others, <laughs> probably more. But, but boy, what are boy most, howdy, do I ever! Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, what are the most important ones you have, Meredith, that would be good for me and others to hear? So uh, 
the other ones that I think would be big would be allow a right of appeal at to a federal court. Um, and this is especially important when you're dealing with, uh, you know, things that are very based in case law, like fair use um, is very heavily common law. And when there's no way to review it by an outside court, that raises some concerns uh, for fair use advocates like myself. Um, that's kind of the big one. Um, the other one would be to require uh, any uh, arbitrators or judges or whatever we're going to end up calling them um, to require them uh, on their own cognizance to consider fair use as a defense. Um, because what we're concerned about is that you're going to have folks who get served and who come in before this tribunal and they're not lawyers at the end of the day. Um, and they're supposed to be, you know, this is supposed to be a highly informal, but to affirmatively require the judges sitting on these cases to consider a laundry list of potential defenses, such as fair use, or, uh, you know, if you, libraries are a weird case because there's now a library opt-out system, but, you know, statutory rights that libraries have, uh, which are their own separate sections. Uh, libraries get their own special treatment under copyright law. Um, so to require the folks adjudicating these to affirmatively think these things through and basically make the arguments on behalf of the defendant um, to make sure that we don't have situations where somebody just doesn't know how to argue fair use and therefore they get stuck with a bill. Thanks, that's, that's really helpful, thanks. So several people in the chat we've noticed have been asking questions that basically want to know how common, usual, and risky is employing fair use today? And this question is welcome to all of our panelists to comment on. I guess I'll, I'll jump in to start. I, I don't think it's terribly risky commonly today. And, and we routinely advise clients to go ahead and, and employ the doctrine of fair use uh, in their documentary films, because I think Documentary films are exactly what fair use was designed to encourage, and, and the use of archival material is essential in telling the stories. And, and again, if there's anyone in the audience who has not seen the best practices guide that was referred to earlier that, that Pat and Michael and, and Bart and others worked on, I urge you to go read it because I, I think it lays out the case beautifully for why documentary filmmakers should and are allowed to use fair use in their films. Uh, and that certainly matches uh, our experience and sen sentiment. In fact, I, I thought in a way I had answered that before in that given the fact that we uh, work on, uh, hang on, uh, 350 films last year, uh, and every and we always have claims in the office, but we have never had a client sued when we had a chance to talk to the person. Um, it just the, uh, the 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 law is too clear. And and <clears throat> the way we do it when we talk to these people, we we plan ahead what we think are the most applicable examples, and then we have a library of films and books and articles of things that have been adjudicated. And we can send them, we, we have a conversation and then we send them a nice letter. And the letter always includes uh, a video or, or now, now that we send uh, thumb drives or a link to a film like what they're complaining or uh, a video or, or a, a, a copy of uh, the use of a photo like they're complaining about or the use of music like they're complaining about. We, we send similar situations and say, here's what the court did in that case. And it sounds to us kind of like you have the same complaint and it's, it's highly persuasive. Um, a lot of the, and, and I think Dale kind of suggested this, a lot of the complaints that come in are complaints by people who just want to make that last fight for a buck or don't really understand fair use. And this particularly comes in to, to the personal rights that we now get into all the time because you now we're doing so many scripted films. Um, it, it, people have this notion, how to be paid, because I was in the film, 
um, again, just having a very collegial conversation. We're not litigators. We don't say we're right, you're wrong, sue us if you don't agree. But just by having a very collegial, educational, respectful conversation. Um, even even when the NBA called us about uh, uncut gems, it was a collegial uh, conversation. Um, really educating them a little bit on the law. Yes, yes, there were a lot, a lot of basketball footage, but then we sh showed how they applied and it, they backed off, which was a little surprising. Um, so anyway, uh, thank I, you. For I, can I just weigh in and say, Michael's exactly right about this. You know, those conversations are essential in resolving most of these, these complaints. And so one of the real dangers of the CASE Act is by creating a formal process where people are filing official complaints and starting the ball rolling in a process like that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I worry about the fact that it's going to eliminate those kinds of, of informal conversations and opportunities to make these complaints go away. That's exactly how we handle them at Frontline. And, and it, you know, it happens infrequently, but when it does happen, we typically are able to walk through it and talk people off the, the ledge, um, often before they even talk to lawyers or think about formal processes. I think you're right that there'll be there'll be more of these conversations. I don't the fact they filed a claim that because of you have 60 days to opt out, that sort of gives you 60 days to to settle it. And um, uh, if you don't opt out, there's I Meredith will have to help me. It seems like there was 90 days before you had to answer or something. I, I forget. There's a it seemed to me it was a a, a kind of slowed down process. I believe it's 60. 60 days. 60 days to opt out, yeah. Yeah. So there, there's 120 days all tacked up. It's really, okay. Uh, you, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I, I am curious about, given that we're talking about um, legislation that could potentially help or hurt um, the little guy in the creator community. Um, and there are plenty of questions about, but don't you think it's a good idea for the little guy to have some kind of recourse here? I just wanna point out that what we've been hearing from people is not that whether it's a good idea for everyone to be able to use the law if they've been damaged, but a question of which mechanisms work. One of the things that's also been raised is about orphan works and the problems that orphan works create. And orphan, there was orphan works legislation that in, in my opinion was not bad. And it just, it has gone nowhere. Whereas the CASE Act, which seems to have many downsides for independent creators has leaped forward. Does anybody know like why, why the orphan works legislation didn't go forward when when this thing that is obviously so flawed has funny you mentioned it uh because uh i i was on orphan works not only testified before congress but in in the drafting sessions and it did get through the senate and uh, uh, Congressman Berman, uh, who's a great guy on many levels, the night be after it had been uh, voted by the committee to go to the floor of Congress, he called a former staffer who worked at Paramount Pictures and said, uh, have you, are you guys happy with this? And the former staffer said, oh no, we need to have injunctive relief in Orphan Works, Berman sat on it. And I, I'm, I'm afraid I lost it with him, with, with Cong I'm not Senator, Congressman Berman. Uh, he's, he was my Congressman. Um, and I saw him a week later <clears throat> at a party and um, 
uh, I was uh, I, I was angry. You know, the the studios had weighed in. The studios had approved it, and then he calls one guy at one studio who hadn't really been a part of it, who gave a snap judgment. Oh, we have to have injunctive relief. It died right there and can't get it started again. It's really exhausting. Um, I, I, um, I feel uh, like I opened up a, a digression here that I should not have because people have asked so many good questions. I'm turning this back to Aisha who's running the Q&A section. And because we only have another 24 minutes here, um, I'm gonna encourage her to, her to pick the questions she likes, but also for everybody to speed talk the answers. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the big questions we've gotten is, could this act be repealed? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It could be. Um, there's a couple of different things that can happen. Um, you know, it could be repealed by Congress. It could be patched by Congress. Uh, it could be subject to a lawsuit. Um, and then there's questions about when the lawsuit comes and on what grounds. Um, so it's an open, it's an open question. Um, one of the things that um, I know, Michael, you kind of flagged earlier uh, was there's all these constitutional concerns about this system um, and kind of the ship has sailed. But one thing we kept hearing from lawmakers um, was, well, you know, it might not be constitutional, but then the courts can sort that out. Um, like, we don't really care. We just rather get it out the door. And like, if it's, if it's unconstitutional, the courts figure that out on the back end. Um, so that argument as a, somebody who spends a lot of time on the Hill was a little frustrating to run into. Um, but yeah, there's, it is unclear right now since we're still very fresh off of its initial passage. Gil, did you have a comment as well? No, I, I, I tried to speed talk and say, yes, it could be. Uh, and I, I agree with Meredith that probably it'll, it'll be resolved in the courts if Congress doesn't fix it. Turning a little bit to the international implications, we have a global audience with us today. Um, one uh, question that's been asked is, what is, what if somebody overseas pirates your work? Can you use the CASE Act against them and what would that look like? You could, uh, it'd be an uphill climb. It also depends on the kinds of pirating you're talking about. Um, a lot of pirating of video content um, especially overseas has a tendency to happen uh, by sort of larger commercial scale operations. Um, this is outside the scope of this panel, but there is also a bill that was passed at the same time in the same package about felony streaming um, that was actually surprisingly, I will say this as somebody who's not a fan of the concept of felony streaming, um, the actual bill was very limited in scope and it really does just go after commercial streaming sites uh, online. Um, and it is, there's all kinds of problems with, um, you know, trying to get actors overseas. We have treaties that basically say, well, if it's not a felony, then we're not going to extradite them or try to charge them in our own country. So that's a very big complicated mess. Uh, overseas is going to raise a lot of questions. You can certainly file a claim. Enforcement is really the issue. Um, in, in most of these cases, when I hear from clients who have these problems, uh, you know, the idea that they're going to be able to enforce a judgment, even if they can get it, is a very difficult one. Another question we've gotten in the chat is, is injunctive relief going to be an option for this tribunal, or will that only come through the previously existing legal structure? Uh, will, it, will a copyright holder be able to mandate your removing an item from a documentary? Uh, I believe not. Um, uh, Michael and I talked about this a little bit, but I, I believe it is just uh, monetary relief and injunctive relief would still have to come through a full federal court process. My apologies, Meredith, for all of the questions going towards you. We have a question from Richard Hall, and he remarked that the discussion has focused on documentaries with substantial budgets. What about no budget short films? Do you see anything changing for them? I, I think the, the issues that I raised about, uh, about the, the increased likelihood of claims is, is 
you know, the smaller the budget of your film, the more of a problem that that's likely to present. And, and that not necessarily in every case, but in many cases. And, and uh, so that that's my primary concern. And, and hopefully Richard heard that in my comments. Th those are the, the folks I'm most worried about. I don't love this new law for frontline purposes either, but for small independent filmmakers, I think this is very problematic. And another question we've gotten from Stacy Goldigate uh, is how can someone file a claim on a project before it has been completed? In other words, if they don't know what footage will be used for fair use, would they be filing a claim preemptively? Also, could there be any instances where a project is bombarded by multiple claims? Uh, I think those are good questions. As Meredith said, there's a lot of, of details that have that have, still have to be worked out that we'll need to hear from the Copyright Office about. But yes, there is some risk of, of being bombarded with multiple claims, as Michael, I think, referred to and Meredith did too. Some of these claims get filed by people for reasons other than, than genuine copyright considerations. And, and I do worry about the Case Act being used as the Copyright Act has occasionally been used for political purposes or to try to interfere with the distribution of a film that that a, a deep pocketed subject is trying to stop or punish or deter in some way. So it's possible, clever lawyers can do all sorts of things with laws like this one. And I, I would like to build on that with a question to Meredith. Uh, is, is, there a, uh, is there a provision or if not, would you favor a provision that allows the new Case Act judges, I don't think they're called judges, but the, the, the Case Act judges to um, punish somebody who brings a, 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 fall, a, a claim for other purposes, uh, such as like the federal court can do and, and, and did to Yoko Ono, for instance. Uh, yes, in short, uh, we would we would support something like that. Um, the main protective mechanism that is in the bill uh, that's been it's been a minute since I read the actual text, but um, if I recall correctly, the main protective mechanism in there is that the register of copyrights can basically bar a party from using Case Act Tribunal um, if they have filed just like straight up abusive claims and there's a pattern of it. Um, it is unclear what that pattern needs to be. It's unclear what they mean by barring a party. Is it a situation where you can dissolve? an LLC and get a new one and come back? Is it individual practitioners? Like what kind of, what are we talking about? How do you define bad faith? Um, you know, as somebody who does a lot with copyright stuff in the DMCA, um, you know, in theory, there's a provision for DMCA takedowns issued in bad faith, section 512F. In practice, that is absolutely dead letter. Um, courts have considered it before and basically said, well, it's all, so we don't know, we can't, the state of mind is too iffy. Um, you know, this is the lens case for any lawyers following along at home. Um, so, you know, I would like to see something that would have more teeth in there if we're gonna do this um, and would be maybe automatic and not left up to the discretion of the register. Um, but, you know, again, that's all design choices. Right. Shifting gears a moment, uh, we have a question on whether the tribunal will understand fair use, especially if two non-lawyers start arguing fair use. And in addition to that question is, will you be able to use a lawyer in this tribunal or will it be similar to a small claims where you do not use a lawyer? So you can bring a lawyer. Um, you don't have to have one. Uh, and there's one of the other concerns that has come up is what happens if the person bringing the claim has a lawyer and the person defending against the claim does not. Um, so there's provisions in there, I believe, that have to do with pointing uh, people defending against claims towards resources where they might be able to get one uh, if they are being served by somebody who does have a lawyer. Um, the fair use question is interesting because, you know, as somebody who is a dedicated fan of fair use, um, it is also very frustrating part of the law because it is highly fact specific and what that ends up being in a lot of cases is just a sniff test for a judge. 
um, and whether they feel like a literary critic that day uh, in some cases, uh, and whether they ultimately think the use was like fair or not in the legal sense, but like, do I, am I mad about this use or not? Um, and so this is part of why the appealability issue is really big to us because in a normal, in a normal court, if a judge just kind of does their own thing and thinks like, you know, maybe the four factors point this way, but I really don't think this is an okay use. Um, and then they rule that way, you can appeal that up and the higher court can reverse them. Um, because there's no appealability in this situation, what that initial judgment it is just stands. You can't really do anything about it. Um, so yeah, in theory, they're supposed to keep up with the case law. They're supposed to adjust the way they think about these things based on how cases have developed out in the federal courts. And they're supposed to try to mirror that, but there isn't really much of an accountability check um, built into it right now to make sure that they actually do. Yeah, and speaking of accountability, just to shift a little bit, um, one question that we've been getting again and again is the discouraging response to trolls. And I wonder, uh, panelists, um, anyone who has a, any thoughts on uh, how we can go about addressing and responding to trolls? Well, I think the federal courts have done a very good job in one instance that, that many of you have probably read about. Uh, one particular troll who in addition to filing a lot of claims spuriously has, has uh, handled his practice poorly, I think would be the best way to, to say it nicely. Um, so I, you know, it, it's nice to see the federal system and the federal judges take action against somebody who was behaving inappropriately. As Meredith says, one of the things that's really missing from the CASE Act, and we'll need to see what the rules look like when the Copyright Office comes out, is how will this new system handle trolls, particularly trolls who misbehave? I don't think we know. We don't, but uh, fortunately, the, uh, <laughs> the Copyright Office is very sensitized mm -hmm. to this issue. I've had several conversations with them on that issue in terms of federal courts and in terms of uh, just how to deal with trolls. And they, uh, uh, every everybody in the copyright office from the register down to her next uh, level of leaders um, has expressed genuine concern and genuine offense uh, at the, at, at the copyright trolls who just file, 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 file. Uh, whether, and it's mostly photographers and music, uh, but uh, the uh, technological ability to do it with uh, filmed clips is uh, growing and uh, we'll have the same thing there. So there's a, nobody knows how it's gonna turn out. Um, I just want to piggyback on that because I saw a question pop up in the Q&A that basically just asked, what do you mean when you say trolls? Um, so just to <laughs> define our terms a little bit. Um, a copyright troll is somebody who brings a copyright claim uh, that is without merit and they know it is without merit, um, but basically to the for the point of extracting a settlement. Um, so it's a bad faith filer. So um, the, the particular troll Dale was mentioning earlier uh, has a uh, practice where he repre represents photographers and there's questions about whether he actually represented some of these people and they didn't agree to what was going on, um, but basically would find uses of these photographs that we either, in a lot of cases, were either clear fair uses or he would target um, more vulnerable parties like individuals, nonprofits, churches, you know, folks that don't have a legal team um, and would send basically these very threatening letters say like, you know, I'm gonna sue you for $150,000, but I'll go away if you pay me $20,000, like that kind of thing. Um, very rarely do they actually want these cases to get to court because, you know, a copyright troll in a federal system can often, you know, kind of fall, fall apart uh, as we've seen. Um, but that's what a troll does is basically they use the, the hammer of copyright law to extract, in most cases, just extract settlements for things that there's no, there's absolutely kind of no way that, they'd be able to get that if they went through the full process. Thank you for giving that quick de definition. Another um, uh, sense of confusion in, in the chat as well has been the definition of opt out and what exactly that entails. So if you could provide a, just a quick overview of what that entails. We don't know. 
Uh, <laughs> we know you'll have 60 days to do it, give or take, um, but we don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet. That's a question that is left up to the Copyright Office and the rulemaking they're going to be spending the next year and a half on. Uh, so could I uh, follow up on that, Meredith? It has been my understanding that what opt out means is that you are opting out of conducting this, this conflict in this place. And that after you said, I'm not participating here, the person who's, who's brought this complaint could bring it to an, a, a, a real court. There seems to be an absolute confusion at the most basic level of what opt out means. Right. So opting out of a case act claim does not mean that you're off the hook for potential copyright infringement. That just means I don't want to use this particular uh, tribunal to settle these claims. Um, so if you get a message and you say, no, thank you, you can expect that you there is a chance that you may get a follow up notice saying, OK, I'll see you in federal court. Um, so all it is, is just, I don't want to have this fight in front of the case panel, um, but they may bring it somewhere else. So it's, it's presented kind of as an alternative uh, to having to actually duke it out in a full federal court. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking a little bit about um, pre uh, precedent, uh, one question that we had was, would previous legal precedent still be admissible to make an argument? Presumably, yes. But again, the rules have not been established as of yet, but, but we presume the answer is yes to that. All right. Our next question is from John Seward. He asked, a portion of the law addressed filming on public and federal lands that seemed confusing. Could you address that at all? Could, could, could you repeat the beginning of that at least? Sure, sure. So a portion of the law addressed filming on public and federal lands that seemed very confusing. Could you address this part? I know nothing about that one. Uh, I may have missed that in the final bill. Same for me, sorry. Same. Okay, so our next question is is there I just want to ask Matt to repost the links uh, to Michael's uh, law firm, to Dale's um, uh, law clinic, and to EFF and PK, uh, because a number of questions are, hey, how do, how do I get to the law clinic? <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or like, what, what think tanks am I supposed to be uh, linking to? And I've put some of these links in, but, but I just want to make sure they're repeated for people. And I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not encouraging that. I'm trying to answer, I'm, I'm trying to answer simple questions uh, on the fly in the Q&A. Yeah, and I, I would be uh, happy to answer the questions that are film specific. Uh, I'll let they'll answer questions like, how do I get to the clinic? Uh, <laughs> We're easy to find, uh, okay. but thank you for, for posting yeah. the links, Matt. And everybody knows how to get to Michael's firm. Uh, anyone that, that, that I know in the documentary business knows how to get to, to Donaldson and Califf, uh, and rightly so. Okay, we're coming to, we're coming up uh, to a close. Um, perhaps another couple of questions, Aisha. Yep. So our next question is from Patricia Cunliffe, uh, and she asks, "What are the parameters of the law?" in regard to a piece of artwork that is derivative of a photo of a famous person? So a pretty specific question, but if anyone has any thoughts on this one. The normal fair use applies. Um, uh, often the worry is the people in the photo uh, and the people in the photo have all their personal rights. Fortunately, the one that most people uh, will jump on is the right of publicity. Oh my gosh, I, I heard that I have a right to control the use of my image, but the law specifically in California and many other states and where it isn't specifically in the law, the courts have put it in the law, say that, wait a minute, 
if your image appears in a creative work, the right of publicity doesn't apply. Um, so uh, Dale, you wanna supplement I, I, I agree with what Michael said exactly. Uh, you know, the, the, that right of publicity or those personal rights that are involved are, are really quite limited. And I think there's a lot of confusion out there about it, but it would be difficult to answer the question really well without some more context about what exactly the, the questioner is, is really focused upon. I think this is one of those cases that Patricia was talking about before that it's difficult to give a really square answer on right now. And one of our final questions is, um, Speaking of people working in this space, are there any other think tanks dogging this? For example, the ACLU. So yeah, ACLU did weigh in on this. They opposed it. Um, they opposed the Case Act, I think, during its initial passage through the House um, for basically some of the same sort of free speech concerns and the ability to, you know, the, the damages and just the uh, spectrum of things that we've mentioned already. Um, unfortunately, there are not a ton of uh, organizations that work on copyright from the like consumer user side. That's I joked when one of my colleagues was hired on the number of people who knew anything at all about music licensing in Washington DC grew 10% that day. Um, <laughs> there's not, there is not a lot of us. Uh, so the big ones are like public knowledge, um, EFF, uh, the center for democracy and technology CDT works on this quite a bit. Um, there's the Recreate Coalition, which is a coalition of orgs, um, and also some businesses um, that work on this. There are also, you know, there are web platforms that are very interested in Case Act, like Pinterest has a, <laughs> Pinterest has a very vested interest in making sure this, this turns out right. Um, Etsy, Patreon, same things. A lot of the platforms that are used by small artists are very concerned, um, both from how this is implemented for artists bringing claims and also implementing it because they see that a lot of their user base might end up on the receiving end of a lot of these claims. Um, so there's a bunch, um, you know, I'd really recommend, um, obviously following us. Uh, I think we're great. That's just my opinion. Um, but yeah, definitely keep an eye on, uh, EFF fight for the future, public knowledge center for democracy and technology are going to be the big ones sending up flares as this moves forward. And Aisha, I see that we're so close to the end. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm itching to say the same thing we said at the very beginning. And, and Dale and I both said it. And I think uh, Pat uh, and, and Meredith would agree. Whatever you do, don't back away from exercising your constitutionally based right of free use, fair use. It's just uh, too important. It's too important to the telling of your stories in an effective way. So this is, it, it really um, it doesn't matter how the adjustments come out. Uh, we'll, we'll figure out ways to make it as easy as possible for you to navigate though the new and a bit odd system that has been put in place. Um, but please know that uh, there's a plenty of places that have your back and mostly the case law has your back. Thanks again to our panelists and thank you to everyone for tuning in. We appreciate your time and thoughtfulness and we hope you have a better understanding following this conversation of the Case Act and fair use and all of the implications for you. Uh, once again, the session is being recorded and broadcast live on SOC's YouTube channel and you're welcome to browse this conversation later. Um, I will turn it back over to Bart to close us out. I think you're on mute. Yeah, I didn't realize I was closing this out. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, um, please tell everybody you know to watch this. And um, I really want to thank Pat and her team and all of our speakers for doing just an incredible job. And uh, thank you. <laughs>